Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on uh, the challenges of IU fishing and the potential of international cooperation and the role of Norway uh, in addressing this relevant challenge in the run up for the United, United Nations Ocean Conference next, next uh, week in Lisbon. Uh, I am Lucas de Oliveira Pais. I'm a senior researcher here at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. It is my pleasure to host uh, this event uh, as part of the activities of the Center for Ocean Governance. Uh, and it's, my, it's, 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 it's really good to have to be to have the, the privilege of having such a, uh, great speakers uh, accepting to share their knowledge with us today and be mediated by, by another great expert. So today we have uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Daddy Serafin, the Secretary General of the Fisheries Commission of West, West, West uh, Gulf of Guinea, uh, who is going to um, talk about is uh, has has done some some very relevant work uh, on the challenge for addressing IU fishing in West West Africa, uh, and we are also having uh, joined him uh, Blake Radcliffe, uh, research associate in the Stimson Center, who has uh, ex extensive work in both academia and policy. Uh, and this conversation will be mediated by Dr. Ifesinachi Okafor Yarwood, a lecturer in, in, in the University of St. Andrews, who has extensive work on uh, IAU fishing in outlets such as marine policy and frontiers of marine, marine science. So without further ado, uh, uh, just uh, uh, if it, just uh, on the program, uh, uh, I'm, now, I'm now going to pass the word to Ife, who is going, who's going to set up the debate. Uh, there will be a brief presentation uh, by both uh, Dr. Seraphine and Blake Radcliffe, uh, uh, followed by uh, a moderated conversation. Uh, and after that, we are going to open for Q&A for all of, all of you who, is, who, are, who are attending the seminar. And I uh, very much uh, appreciate the attention for this event. Uh, without further ado now, actually, uh, let me just pass the, the, the ball to Ife. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Lucas, and welcome. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, today we're going to be talking about um, the challenges to sustainable fisheries management and the role that international cooperation and of course now Norway could play in helping improve the situation. And before I hand over to our experts who would share their views by giving a five to ten minutes presentation, I'd like to note at this point that as you're listening and you think of a question, please uh, feel free to input your question on the Q&A um, session of the Teams chat. And once it's time for us to address the questions, um, we'll do well to also respond to it. And so we're here to talk about this topic because of the significant role that fisheries or marine fisheries or seafood play in uh, food security and contributing to proteins of billions of people globally. Actually, more than three billion people rely on seafood either for food security or their protein needs. Seafood also um, contributes to the income of over 800 million people globally. And so this gives you an idea of the significance it also contributes to a revenue or GDP of coastal states and small island developing nations. But at the same time, the ability of this, or should I say seafood to continue to contribute to the livelihoods and the economy and sustainable development of coastal states, small island nations and their people is threatened existentially by unsustainable practices. And so today we have two experts to help us understand what these issues are and what can be done differently um, by way of international cooperation to address them. I'd like to invite um, Dr. Dedi Serafin to use his five to ten minutes to talk to us about what he sees as the challenges to sustainable um, fisheries and what role does he think that um, international cooperation and development assistance can play in addressing these issues? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ife, for this uh, introduction. Um, I'll try to share my screen.
But uh, before I go for that, I would like uh, to thank the Institute of International Affairs for this opportunity. As uh, Lucas rightly said, we are moving to the next uh, OCEAN conference, and it's very important to share our experiences and also prepare to discuss with other partners. So we have five or ten minutes, what I heard, but it's for me an opportunity to really talk about globally what is FCC and what we have done and how that is impacting the, the fishing uh, management in our region. So I'll go quickly through this uh, presentation and I hope the document can be kept for uh, further development within uh, this period. So for the committee, it's comprised with uh, six countries from Liberia to Cote d'Ivoire uh, to Nigeria. You can see Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Togo, Benin, and Nigeria. So the aim is to promote cooperation among member states, but also, of course, with all relevant partners that can are uh, interested in uh, this uh, this process. That's why our vision is to work together to achieve an efficient and very dynamic uh, fisheries management in our region. So it's really linked to the theme of this discussion, build cooperation, build partnership to uh, really dynamically work in the fisheries sector. So these are the country of the region. And uh, you can see we are in West Africa and the uh, IU has become very permanent in this region and we have to really work together to solve the problem. So FCC is an intergovernmental organization. It means that country has come together to really address the common uh, challenges and the uh, IU has been identified as a key component of this, uh, these uh, challenges. So through our strategic action plan, you can see we have identified six uh, action area and uh, combating IUU and uh, maritime security is one of the key action or area for our organization. And in addition to that, you can see that the other components also call for partnership, call for joint action, like regional fisheries management action uh, plan is also a, a key point. So why are you is it permanent in our region? One of the reason is the, because the, the, this region is providing a lot of fishing resources and country are very interested for these abundant fisheries, that's why bell cells and octaves are coming to this region. And uh, for this region, we have been observed that we produce about 1 million 293 tons per year. And this is very important and it also involves a lot of population, a lot of actors from this region. So for all this region, reason, we are really to address the IUU activities. Looking at the challenge for this region to combat IUU, it's a very important to understand it because that will help us to take the proper action. We observe that globally there is a week of MCS. VMS and IES are available in many of the country, and this has been the area where we are working. No observer program in some of the st states no green patrol was conducted addressing the uh, fishing sector and uh, lack of political will to deal really with uh, IUU. So these are some of the challenges that we are working on it and that conduct uh, to some of the offenses that we are observing in this region. Because of this lack of challenges of the country to take action, we have noticed a lot of uh, IUU offenses. So, the first one is that fishing activity is bad without authorization, and this is very, very important. We also observe some illegal trade fish in this region, and we also look at that vessel coming to act in this region are trying to avoid uh, uh, to be controlled, avoid the system that we are in place, and we need to be very pertinent to really address them. 
So, so many uh, offenses are op op uh, observed here, and that's why we are taking action to really combat uh, the IU fishing. So, in terms of action, the first action is to set up regional and streaming mechanism. Uh, as a regional fishing body, we just have uh, arrangements that are not binding, but it gives guidelines, it gives good way, it's good best practices for the country to take. So from our establishment to now, we have been set up a number of arrangements between the member country to really deal with IUU. So we have convention uh, on minimum condition of access. We have convention on information sharing because it's very important. We have a strategic document to combat transshipment. IUU report, all this document has been discussed within the member country and adopted. So now we are in the, the position to really implement each of these instruments. We also uh, pay a key attention to intelligence reports. It's very important that we provide intelligent information and MCS support to the member country. And that is done within our regional platform that we call West Africa Task Force. That's the way where we really discuss the convention and try to implement them. We also try to improve governance in this region. We observe that many of the countries are committed or they want to combat IU, but they don't have a dedicated plan, national plan to combat IU. So we are supporting them to adopt a national plan of action that are aligned on the regional plan of action, which also is aligned on the international IU, uh, uh, international plan to combat IU. We also um, create a country to develop national VMS centers, and that is very important. And based on the regional one that we have, we are able to assist the country to go ahead in the national VMS development. Also, we support effective PSC uh, postage measure agreement implementation, ratification and implementation. As I'm telling you, all the six countries of the FCC region are today committed by ratification to the PSMA uh, implementation. So we are assisting them and we are conducting at each uh, pilot uh, port in Tema in uh, Abidjan action to combat IUU fishing. Uh, and also through the purchase measure uh, agreement, which is the most binding instrument to combat IUU currently. So, as I was saying, globally speaking, these are our achievements through the action that we have been taking so far. And you can see that each of the country are developed plan now. We have set up a regional MCS. We have encouraging country to set up also the uh, national MCS. And we also develop partnership with relevant regional center that is also an institution that are committed in combating IU or in capacity building. So, for all the activity we have done so far, what is the role of the international support? And this international support we are looking at at three levels. First, as institutional and strategical partners level, which are mainly uh, FAO, FAO, for instance, that we start working together. We have ECOWAS, we have uh, Nepal, we have African Union, that are our institutional and strategical partners. And when we come to implementation partners, we have uh, stock legal fisheries that I've been working with, but we also track mark tracking, that is our key technical partner right now in the frame of combating IUU in this region. And as you are aware, the track mark tracking is supported by uh, NORAD uh, funding. And as you see down, we have the funding partner and we can see NORAD. And I can tell you that the NORAL support, as we are talking about role of the uh, institution, the NORAL support has been the key. Uh, this support has been helping to really strengthen our cooperation in this region and also take action in terms of combating IU. Maybe through the question, I will come and develop more about that. So in terms of lesson learned, it's very important that to build on existing framework. The NORAD support and the track battery support came to build on the West Africa Task Force and the 
and the FCDC working group that was in place. It's also helped to operationalize some our key convention that we have developed. I mentioned it before, and we also we think through this partnership with Tracmark Tracking that is very important that for combating IU, we more and more involve no state actors in the activities. Now we are moving to have a regular joint effort, um, the capacity building, but also we think that national, regional, and international effort to combat IU is very pertinent. You can find us because it's very important to share our experience and let people know what we are doing. So we have developed a communication strategy with all these support uh, tools to really share our experiences. In terms of way forward, we think that we have to continuously support uh, capacity building in this region. We think that we have to continue to engage partners. And we recently think that journalists uh, and media can play a key role in this uh, platform. We now want to move forward with an observer program on the vessels so that we may know what is happening in each of the vessels operating in this region. We also think that we should conduct a regular joint patrol to support implementation of the measures that we have in the region. And at the end, we think that all the experiences, all the uh, capacity building material that we have developed, all the partnership that we have developed to strengthen capacity of the actor of this region, we can, based on that, develop a dedicated program on ocean governance in uh, uh, West Africa region to really support the blue economy. So thank you very much for your time and through this picture that I like very well, if we all come together like this, we can move forward and address the key challenges in the fishery sector. Thank you. And thank you so much, um, Dr. Dady, for um, an excellent presentation. Not only did you share some of the challenges, but you were also able to highlight some of the progress that has been made and how FC WC countries are working together, or at least trying to work together to improve fisheries governance, including the support and how international cooperation and collaboration can help. I especially liked how you also shared some point on what needs to happen, you know, the way forward. And so whilst we're waiting for the opportunity to have further discussion on this, I would also like to invite Blake to tell us what he feels based on his expert opinion, of course, are the challenges to fisheries sustainability and what role international um, cooperation and development assistance can play in stemming the tides. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think for the kind introduction and uh, thanks also to the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. My name is Blake Radcliffe. I'm a research associate as noted um, at the Stimson Center's Environmental Security Program. And for those unfamiliar with Stimson, we're a think tank based in Washington, DC. Um, and in Stimson's environmental security program, we examine the linkages between environmental and resource degradation and how that affects economic, food, and security uh, of countries, particularly um, developing states, and how, if not addressed, that could lead to instability. So we um, first conduct research on an issue, such as IU fishing, seafood transparency, draft recommendations, um, and then seek partners to help pass policies into law. Uh, and we also... I hear another microphone. Sorry. Um, uh, and so we work with the government to implement these policies, which includes assessment um, and making further recommendations as part of a research to action model. And I'm honored to join this panel today and speak about uh, uh, IAU fishing and the need to improve fisheries and management capacity, uh, particularly in the developing world and uh, with a bit of a West African focus. Um, and let me just, I guess, you know, uh, take a step back uh, about IU fishing uh, as a global industry, which generates profits of up to, uh, you know, an, an estimated $36 billion a year and could make up between 20 to 50 percent of the global fish catch. Um, IU fishing affects not just developing states, but it's a major problem uh, for major market states as well, including the United States, the EU and Norway. And so the IU fishing industry itself is largely clandestine 
which makes it very difficult to understand its true effects on global fish stocks. According to the UN FAO, over 93% of the world's fisheries are either depleted or fish to their maximum sustainable yield. At the same time, the demand for seafood continues to rise around the globe. Uh, and so adding IU fishing into the mix uh, makes it very hard to know the true status of those numbers. Uh, makes it very difficult to accurately manage global fisheries, um, which support the livelihoods as, uh, of many, uh, as noted previously. Um, IU, IU fishing is more than an environmental concern. It's a development issue that threatens the food and economic security, particularly of, uh, of developing coastal states. And as Professor Okafor Yar would noted at the outset, over 3 billion people depend in West Africa um, uh, 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 as, uh, on fish as their primary source of protein. Um, and in countries like Senegal, Sierra Leone, Ghana, uh, that percentage is well over 50% uh, of the total animal protein consumed. So it's very dependent on, on the bounty of the ocean. Um, and also that it's interesting that there's different facets to IU fishing. Uh, you know, for some states, specifically in West Africa, it could be foreign trawlers who are fishing within the, you know, who are ex going within the boundaries of the artisanal uh, zone set aside for local artisanal and small scale fishers, further depleting the fish stocks. Um, and we've heard in our research that in some countries like Senegal and Ghana, artisanal fishers themselves are seeking the dwindling catch with, uh, by resorting to IOU tactics, such as using uh, illegal mesh uh, nets or um, fishing with light aggregation, among other um, other illegal tactics. Um, so in 2018, Stimson released a, uh, a report casting a wider net, the security implications of IU fishing, um, which analyzed pervasive threat of IU fishing and its link not only to coastal nations uh, security, but also the relationship of national security and geopolitical stability as well, kind of putting it in a, in a larger framework. And our research found that IU fishing not only drains coastal states of marine resources, but deprives them of vital economic activity, food security, an important tax revenue. In addition, um, uh, illegal fishers often utilize the same networks as other transnational criminal organizations. Um, and IU fishing itself has been linked to uh, numerous incidents in the South China Sea, in East Asia, uh, between fishing vessels and Coast Guard boats or maritime militia boats from China, Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, competing for fish stocks amid disputed waters, um, piracy, of course, in the Gulf of Guinea, um, we've also seen fishing boats uh, with drugs interdicted uh, off the coast of Costa Rica. Um, and there's been numerous interdictions of fishing boats uh, bringing weapons from Iran to Somalia, uh, ultimately destined for Yemen. So there's a dire need for increased global monitoring and surveillance of vessels at sea, um, both within domestic waters and uh, the high seas, as well as greater enforcement and prosecution at the local, regional and international levels. Um, and as a follow-up, uh, Stimson released a, a subsequent report on the security implications of distant water fleets and their connection to IU fishing. Um, a distant water fleet, of course, referring to fishing vessels that could operate uh, in another country's territorial waters or EEZ um, or on the high seas. And uh, IU fishing is linked to distant water fleets across the globe, which itself falls again under a com complex and opaque system. There's a lack of information about where these vessels operate, who owns them, the amount of fish they catch, how fish is moved along the uh, seafood supply chain, um, including transshipment, middlemen, and processing in, in other countries as well. And this lack of transparency impedes effective resource management uh, and enforcement and increases the risk that distant water fleets will engage in IU fishing um, and also uh, increases the uh, possibility of having labor abuses and human rights abuses on the vessels and in the seafood supply chain and processing as well. So uh, uh, our research there uh, sought to determine who these top distant water fleets are, where are they fishing, what are the motivations, what are the implications for the coastal states. So we found the uh, the top distant water fleets are uh, from China, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, and Spain. Uh, combined, they make up about 90% of global distant water fleet operations, with China, Taiwan kind of making up 60% uh, themselves. And they mostly focus uh, their attention on West Africa, East Africa, and the Pacific. And the motivations of these uh, fleets are uh, can be you know kind of uh, bucketed into economics, governance, and access. Uh, economic incentives are the primary driving force. As one of our interviewees noted, fishing fleets are driven by where the fish are, how easily and cheaply they can get those fish to market. 
Um, and secondly, we found that fleets are more likely to fish where governance and enforcement capacity are low. We can govern, we can governments have a reduced capacity to monitor activity, which makes it easier for distant water fleets to underreport catch and engage in IU fishing. Third, uh, uh, fleets operate where they can get the best access agreements uh, to the fish, to another country's waters. And that access is not always equal across the board. Um, we've heard about preferential treatment for certain states. Uh, per the perception that access uh, could be, could involve quid pro quo arrangements, raising concerns about an unequal playing field between local fisher folk and the distant water uh, uh, vessels. Um, and finally, distant water, fleet fish, distant water uh, fishing is often tied to political influence, sometimes corruption. Um, in some cases, fishing access is granted uh, to fleets in exchange for short-term revenue and infrastructure projects. Um, doing some of our field work in Mozambique, we learned that Mozambique has, of course, good fishery management laws. Um, the experts we met with noted that there were some quid pro quo deals uh, between China and the government. One official noted that she was threatened. Another said they were told when it, when it comes to Chinese vessels, just look the other way. And in our interviews in West Africa, um, as Dr. Serafin noted as well, our interviewee spoke of a lack of enforcement or per permissive environments that failed to punish IU fishing su uh, sufficiently and deter uh, uh, a lot of these uh, operations. We've heard that many states in West Africa have good laws in the books and good regulations uh, to combat IU fishing or to promote sustainable uh, fisheries management. Um, including Ghana even before its recent yellow card uh, from the EU. The problem is that these laws are poorly enforced with little capacity, um, inadequate fines, if any, and too many licenses granted to drive over capacity, uh, which you know, further lead to uh, even more depleted fish stocks. So I've heard the government officials themselves can inject themselves into the beneficial ownership arrangements, um, complicating enforcement and reform. And uh, in some states uh, that mandate observer programs uh, for foreign distant water vessels, um, those observers can be paid directly by the vessel owners and assumed to be corrupt or inaccurately monitoring the catch. So, um, and also that, you know, the Port State Measures Agreement is such an achievement, but um, implementation um, is, is, is hard to gauge. Uh, so there needs to be a greater commitment, greater capacity uh, on that end as well. But then turning to what can be done, um, there's a need for action by the developing coastal states, as well by major seafood market states uh, like Norway. Um, and transparency really is crucial to combating IU fishing. Not only will transparency of the fishing sector help law enforcement officials monitor, enforce, and prosecute IU fishing, but it provides the opportunity to enhance fisheries management regimes and overall governance. There are three specific areas where we think uh, transparency would be uh, beneficial uh, in the seafood supply chains, in vessel ownership structures, and vessel movements. So across our research and engagement internationally and also uh, within the US domestically, um, we provide specific recommendations for in, you know, improving transparency, including making sure that AAS uh, and VMS are mandated and AAS is on at all times, both in fishing and on transshipment vessels, requiring full seafood traceability um, across the supply chain, um, and making information about access agreements and vessel ownership publicly available. And we, uh, recommend that coastal nations invest revenues from access agreements back into improved fish, uh, fisheries management rather than have those proceeds funnel to a, could, could be a distant uh, capital city. And fleet nations should also expand electronic catch documentation rather than rely on paper documentation, which can be easily falsified. Um, and we need to end harmful subsidies. And uh, with this, I want to, of course, uh, acknowledge the recent uh, achievement uh, at the WTO just last week, um, which is, as many are calling, a great first step, and more must be done to hammer out further uh, further points, I think, when negotiations reopen in 2023. And finally, you know, uh, flag states and coastal states should be acceding to and implementing the Port State Measures Agreement, which deters legal catch from coming to port. Uh, and so there's so much to be done also by, by the US, EU, and other market states uh, to improve the capacity. Um, in the U.S., we work a lot with uh, our agencies to uh, 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 improve uh, and combat IU fishing internationally um, and to stop catch from coming into the U.S. seafood market, hoping that provides a deterrent effect um, from fishers uh, down the supply chain. Um, the U.S. provides uh, direct aid and support by USAID, State Department, NOAA. Um, the U.S. Coast Guard has shiprider agreements in West Africa and the Indo-Pacific to improve monitoring, enforcement, and coastal state wa uh, waters. 
Um, the Depar Department of Defense's uh, AFRICOM coordinates Operation Omangambe Express uh, in the Gulf of Guinea, which is the exercises in marine uh, maritime security. And the last few exercises had anti-IUU components, which is a great development and great to, to see that incorporated into these, uh, these real security arrangements. Um, but uh, in the US, IUU fishing is actually a rare priority with bipartisan political support. So Simpson was instrumental in, in drafting and getting past the Maritime Safe Act a few years ago, which has adopted and coordinates uh, a whole of government approach to fight IAU fishing in the U.S., bringing together over 20 agencies uh, in an interagency working group, working on a lot of different angles um, in a coordinated way. And so far, they have designated some priority regions for uh, IAU fishing uh, risk, and we're waiting for their five-year plan to uh, be released later this summer. Uh, and the Biden administration, too, is expected to enhance further domestic seafood traceability by strengthening the Seafood, seafood Import Monitoring Act, SIMP, uh, which stops IU catch from entering the U.S. markets. We hear there'll be some announcements uh, next week at the UNOC, um, and we'd like to see SIMP uh, uh, aligned with its counterpart programs in the EU and now Japan uh, to align together to one have one global interoperable uh, system which can drive enforcement, but also inspire uh, other countries to other market states like Norway to create their own seafood import traceability program and align them as well. Uh, let me just close by saying that IU fishing is prolific. The ocean is large and these vessels are very much out of sight, out of mind, um, and it contributes to overfishing. And we need a global system of transparency accountability in 2022. Uh, for the health, safety, security, and equity of fishers, fishing communities, and the economic, food, and environmental security of coastal nations. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Blake, for a really um, insightful presentation. Again, I liked how you, you talked about or highlighted the importance of fisheries and then went on to discuss the threats of IU fishing and and how um, actions or inaction by coastal states in the global south, unfortunately, might be sort of reinforcing the extent to which it occurs. I also liked how you highlighted how um, things like subsidies might facilitate or is facilitating um, IU fishing directly or indirectly, and then reflected on, on what needs to happen differently or what needs to be done differently. I also like the emphasis on some of the things at the international level, um, international partners are doing to support um, coastal and small island developing states to do things differently. And it is at this point that I want us to sort of have for that conversation. There are points that I've highlighted that I'd like to ask you questions on to again, for that, for that clarity on exactly, you know, how these challenges are playing out and what coastal states are doing already. I know you highlighted them in your conversation, but there are some points that I'd like you to explain further. Um, again, I'd like to start with um, Dr. Deddy, if, if that's okay. And my first question relates to, obviously, the challenges of IU fishing and in your discussion, you highlighted how weak monitoring, control and surveillance is playing a significant role in helping IU fishing proliferate or the proliferation of IU fishing in, in FCWC states. You also highlighted some of the things you're doing to support FCWC states. And I wondered whether you can tell us a bit more, you know, in terms of there is a challenge of MCS or weak MCS, but you also are at the same time trying to support coastal states. Are there examples that you can share with us of how exactly you're supporting and what is happening in terms of positive examples of what has happened since this support started? Okay, thank you very much. This is a very pertinent question. I try to demonstrate it during my presentation that we have challenges, but we are not just sitting aside, not doing anything. We are also trying to support the country. But the first thing that we have to have in mind is the NCS issue is for the country very costed. So one country cannot address alone the effort to be mobilized. So coming together, 
help to reduce the cost in a certain way and also address the issue. One example I would like to put on the table is that we have been with the, our framework and the partnership with the uh, uh, European Union, for instance, can uh, support to establish a regional VMS system, a regional center that comes with VMS and IES. But at the time we're setting this system in place that's covering all the six EEZ of the countries, member of the FCC, it was only uh, Liberia and uh, Cote d'Ivoire only that are this system. So it means that the rest of the region may not have an oversight of the, their EEZ. But with this support and the establishment of this regional center, we have now a full coverage of the EEZ and we can monitor all the vessels coming in this region. One of the examples is the ratification of the Port Set Measure Agreement. When this uh, document was agreed to be ratified, we went to ADB, African Development Bank, to request for their support to prepare the country of this region to be able to ratify the document. The consultant was recruited and went in each of the country supporting the national team by producing ratification document together, sitting together with them, preparing the ratification document and putting the process. So at the end of the day, all the country had the document, needful document to go for ratification and that made the process very easy for them. So that helped to really cover the six countries now today that are committed for the ratification. Same for the national plan of action. At the time we, have, we established our first national plan of action, that was in 2010, it's only Benin that has a national plan of action. But we pushed the country and we explained to them that you cannot address properly and inclusively these activities, if you don't have a national policy document that really describe what you want to do from the beginning to the end and assess your process, internal, internal process and progress also in combating IU. So based on that, we have been able to support with the financial support of AU, support each of the countries to prepare by national plan of action. And this document has been prepared with a, a consultant coming to the country, discussing the country, produce the document, and now we are helping the country to nationally validate this document, to take ownership of the document and start the implementation. So this is the kind of thing we are doing. The most other thing that we are really doing on a regular basis is the capacity building and information sharing. We cannot take action as the fishing inspectors if you don't understand clearly what are the challenges, where the gaps is, what action to be taking. In this area, I would like to emphasize that the support of the NORA through the track back tracking, which is a, a Norwegian foundation that's supporting us, has been very key. Because we have some, I, pre, I presented some of the conventions that we took but we have to implement them. The Convention on Information Sharing was one of the ones we developed before this report. And this report came to help the countries to, and the FCCs to be able to implement this Information Sharing Convention. And that's helped now today to really share information in this region. We share licenses list. We share information on the vessels and we, build, we share intelligence report on cases. For instance, now if a, a country wants to issue a license, it requests for intelligence support before to know if this vessel is not committed in any crime, any illegal fishing activity before it proceeds. And this information is requested among the member country of the region 
and also with international partners like track track by tracking and other agencies that are working in this field and that's very key thank you so much um dr Serafin, for you know sharing those examples those hopeful examples because it sort of help us understand that um the region might not necessarily be where they need to be in terms of improving fisheries governance but they are not where they used to be due to you know some of the examples or some of the things that they are doing with the support of international partners um blake i'd like to also ask a similar question in your presentation you talked about the clandestine nature of IU fishing and of course in places where they have weak monitoring control and surveillance as many countries in west africa do um it becomes even more challenging because you cannot really um, respond to things that you cannot see. And so the question that I'd like to ask is based on the research that you, um, your organization have done or continue to do, are there positive examples you can show us in terms of some of those international cooperation that you've highlighted in your presentation? Are there examples of how things are happening differently, you know, wherein um, countries are improving they are monitoring and surveillance and control in comparison to before where they've been doing it alone. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, yes, I mean, uh, it's, I think there's, there's, uh, there's a lot to be optimistic about, I'll say. Um, there is uh, a lot of global support and we have worked as well with, uh, with TMT and Global Fishing Watch. Um, uh, you have a lot of uh, recognition by uh, funders and by the technical experts of the need for greater transparency um, in various re uh, regions around the world and also in the high seas um, to get a sense of uh, you know where people are fishing and uh, uh, what the operations are and we've seen a, a number of high I mean part of it is just is just improving the as I mentioned improving the transparency making countries uh, and uh, the industry and um, also the general public, you know, the role of the media um, is, is very important, making the greater public aware of, of, of what's going on. And we've had a number of high profile incidents that have had uh, good, uh, good developments following. Um, uh, there were, uh, there was an incident, I, I think in 2020, um, where uh, a number of fishing boats, uh, I think there were Chinese fishing vessels, squid vessels, that were outside of the Galapagos Marine Reserve. Um, and outside of that, they were legally, I mean, most of them were legally fishing outside of the reserve, um, but there was a lot of AAS uh, being turned off and uh, a lot of, it seemed like there was a huge amount of ships and, and incursions. And some of that wasn't necessarily illegal, but it creates the specter that there's some kind of, um, that illegal activity could be happening. And so, uh, um, and so you're, what you saw after that was uh, a greater relationship between the countries in Western uh, uh, South America, uh, Chile, Ecuador, Peru, and, and Colombia coming together um, themselves and uh, getting some funding, I think internationally, but also pledging to um, get a sense of the IU fishing in their waters as well and uh, look for international cooperation uh, to improve the MCS. And, 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 and I hate, you know, I don't necessarily want to um, be pessimistic about China, for example. You know, China has a very large distant fleet that operates all over the place, including West Africa. Um, and and uh, but China themselves has has undertaken a lot of um, positive steps in the last couple of years, uh, embracing transparency reform in some ways and passing numerous right re new regulations um, governing uh, their distant water fleet. Um, so that's there's some positive steps that China has even been taking as well. But you know, the implementation of these laws is is a question. Um, so in terms of looking for positivity, um, I think you're seeing this, you know, kind of a galvanized global support um, uh, in the market states, uh, in the donor states, as well as in the affected um, uh, coastal developing states. OK, um, thank you so much for you know, highlighting the issues again and, and identifying that whilst um, we're not where we need to be in terms of more transparency 
and the fish fish sector um, were not where we used to be. I also like the fact that even though you highlighted um, how uh, China to a large extent um, contributes to either fisheries depletion through overfishing or are you fishing, you also acknowledged that they are making some efforts. Um, I, I, I personally, at least through my research, have examples of how they have suspended subsidies, for instance, for companies that's been implicated for IU fishing in West Africa. And in the spirit of fairness as well, and based on the research that I've done, I'd, I'd also like to highlight that, unfortunately, IU fishing is not something that is restricted, especially on the African continent to one country such as China. Um, entities or countries in the European Union have also been implicated. Other countries like Russia, for example, have been implicated um, as unfortunately engaging in IU fishing on the continent. And this is why I think based on the collective or in terms of the fact that different countries would almost always take advantage where there are loopholes. This is also something that is emphasizing why we need better international cooperation and collaboration. And it is on this note that I'd actually like to ask my second question and either yourself or Dr. Deddy might take it up if you want to, because we've heard so much about transparency, right? In different sectors, it might mean different things to different people. So my question then is, what does transparency mean in the context of the discussion we're having? What should it look like? If you like, if you allow me to start, please. Uh, yes, uh, trans 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 transparency means a lot for the fishery sector. First, because the fishery sector is not a sector well known by most of the people. So it's like we are doing the thing behind the door and nobody knows what's happening there. And this transparency helps us to discover more this area. So transparency means also to bring light, light in all the system that govern the fishery sector. I will take one example. The process of issuing a license to a vessel. How this process is done. How the flag is attributed to some foreign vessels coming down in our region to be registered. And this has been some of the key uh, offensive that many of the vessels of this region or many of the country of this region have been facing. I remember Togo had in the past a yellow card because they had a, 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 a let's say flag, a convenient flag, where many vessel was coming, taking the flag and go to to fish in Panama, to fish far away, where Togo does not have the possibility to control these vessels' activities. You see, so that that was an issue. All the issues. I've been able to observe that when we started the information sharing, you can receive a document declared as a registered document from a country. And when you send this document back to the country, they tell you that, oh, we don't, we are not aware of the document. We don't know where, which agency, national agency that produced it. So we are observing some fake and false documents in this region. And because of the information sharing, I can tell you that today this has totally disappeared. Because any agency issues a document may be sure that it will be shared back for more people to know what is happening. So there are so many examples in, on this point. So to, to, to be to be to be very to, to summarize that is the process. Who has the right thing to do the right thing? Is it doing this thing alone or as a, a team? And sometimes when you go to the country, they ask the cost of a, a license. Nobody will tell you. If you ask for a copy of a license, nobody will give you. 
While the license is a, an administrative document, it should not be hidden. So we have been able in our region to establish a combined list of licensed vessels. So it gives us an opportunity now to know who are the vessel or which are the vessel that are regularly in, uh, issued the license and those who are not. And this has helped us when we go for gun patrol, when we go for fishing patrol, because if a vessel, uh, if the patrol vessels stop a, a, a fishing vessel, you have to be able to say that, okay, you are on the list or not, you are authorized or not. And that's helped a lot to really conduct the VMS issues. Transparency also means the capability to really monitor the vessels that have been issued a license. Where do you fish? Are you fishing the fishing zone or not? Do you authorize authorized zone or not? You see, and this so it gives us opportunity to control the fishing activity globally and the process of issuing documentation to access to the fishing sector in the region. I would like to stop here. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you, really, Daddy. Blake, please. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a very interesting question. And, uh, uh, you know, what is transparency? What does it look like in combating IOU? You know, it's um, there are so many areas where there can be more, essentially just more information, you know, on the water, in the processing and the effects on the communities, um, in the markets themselves, you know, so um, on the water, just getting a better sense of seeing the ships, seeing where they are, um, seeing what, what their catch is and being accurate about that. And um, there's so much that is uh, obscure, uh, uh, even within EEZs, but certainly on the high seas as well. Uh, um, accurate, accurately measuring the fish stocks, so you know the effects, so you know the effects of overcapacity, over licensing, um, mandating electronic cash documentation where it's possible, uh, where you can verify um, you know, seafood throughout the supply chain and see where it goes and ensure that it's legal uh, and improving capacity to make that happen. You know, keeping AAS on, um, monitoring transshipment when you can, um, and uh, tying the licensing and, 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 capaci and, and the capacity itself to uh, sustainable targets, sustainable quotas, um, getting a sense of beneficial ownership, which is incredibly difficult. Um, and a lot of, a lot of uh, organizations uh, C for ADS, for example, does a very good job of kind of penetrating uh, the layers of corporate obfuscation that keep, uh, uh, you know, uh, the names of ships and the ownership uh, uh, just a complete, you know, murky waters. Um, and yeah, as, as uh, access agreements and, and publishing vessel lists would be ideal, and that's probably too tall of, uh, of an ask in many places, but that's still something we should be shooting for. Um, but we all have to, have to understand a, a better way of, of how these uh, the changes, of, uh, the impact of IU fishing are being felt in the communities and how it's changing livelihoods, how it's impacting um, the economic effects and the food security effects, um, you know, taking certain nutrients out of the diet, for example, um, which are being replaced by, uh, you know, less healthy alternatives. Um, uh, but also there's a role for uh, greater transparency in the seafood supply chain, which is something we work on a lot at Simpson um, within the U.S. and with international partners, keeping IU catch out of uh, the global supply chain, um, understanding where the seafood is coming from, how it's routed, and hopefully providing, um, you know, with, with uh, uh, enforcing uh, seafood import uh, programs and through the PSMA, uh, disincentivizing um, IU operations and and just you know there's 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 many smaller tactics but the, the bigger question of transparency is uh, is the goal but you know with greater monitoring with greater MCS monitoring control and surveillance um, that must be followed with enforcement um, prosecution fines deterrence um, to really disincentivize IU fishing um, and so even we see that in the U.S. where you know we, there are certain policies but we want to see we want to see like what are the effects are these working. Are, is there deterrence? Is there a reduction, for example, of IU fish that's coming into the US? There was some report a few years ago uh, that $2.4 billion worth of seafood every year, um, illegal seafood comes into the US. So that's that's a major 
it's a major loophole. It's a major impact in our markets, um, and it affects the uh, proper fishermen around the world who are trying to do things legally with dwindling fish stocks. Thank you so much um, for your responses. And from these responses, it's, it's obviously clear how, you know, just like fisheries, you know, the transboundary nature of fishing itself have also shown based on your responses that we cannot necessarily achieve transparency without cooperation at the international level. This is literally the case because, for example, with the point you raised, Daddy, about sharing information on the, on the licensing, the fact that you have to engage with different agencies and maybe then ask for the question from another country means that already there's something that is interstate happening and this is just at the initial stage. And then Blake, the point you made about seafood entering the US, again, means that without people sharing information openly about certain things, we might not necessarily be able to stop these people that are, you know, unfortunately encouraging the over exploitation of fish stock across the globe. So um, thank you so much. I would want to ask one more question and then we'll open it to the floor, you know, for the Q&A. And that question relates specifically to, you know, exactly funding, issues relating to funding. In your presentation, Dedi, you, you gave a point about three different stages or three different phases and there's one for funding and there Wow, a lot of international uh, actors are supporting the work that you do. And there, my work, my, my question relates to how do we ensure transparency, not just transparency, but continuity. So you, you've started this amazing work and you've shared examples of how FCS or FCWC is trying to encourage countries in West Africa or in their in their region to do better, to improve fisheries governance and by so doing ensure the sustainable development of their of their coastal states and their people. But how do we ensure continuity, given that a lot of your work is funded by international actors, um, international agencies? I'd like you to answer the same question, Blake, with the examples that you have once and they, they have responded, if that's OK. Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, what we are doing with all the partners, the issue of sustainability and the continuity is a key. But before coming to that, I would more like to talk about synergy. Synergy and uh, maybe stimulation. Because you may, you may, you may have a natural fund, natural resources, and by the quality of the work done, you may attract more partners to come to synergize with you to achieve the global results. In our cases, we started this initiative with FAO that we should adopt a regional approach to combat IU or to work together in fisheries management. And the initial support came there's the initial international partner support came from APO. And based on that, NORAD came in to build on the frame that was established and the convention that we have already adopted to assist in the implementation. So through this platform, we have been able to assure visibility of our work. And that also creates additional partners. So uh, as, a, as a secretariat, we need to coordinate all the available resources and build on, try to have synergy to achieve. Now, in the long, medium and long term, the issue of the sustainability comes in. And we are looking at different ways. First is to really attach our activity to strategical and institutional partners like African Union, like ECOWAS, to work with them with us because they have demanded sometimes to negotiate with key partners that we may not be able maybe to touch, for instance. 
But of course, their support will attract international partners, but they have also, as an institution, some internal resources that can also support us. But I, globally speaking, I understand that there is, is really an issue to have sustainability. And currently what we are trying to do with the regional center that we have, I would say we are selling our services now. Our, our, our availability, our capa capability to assist joint patrol, to assist the training uh, process, uh, training program in this region, that's also help us to make, the, in the long term, to make the system sustained by auto financing or self financing. That's the way we are looking also forward. Because we are delivering services and this services, if it's, it's paid back, can also help us to continue. And also, of course, continue to partner with other part uh, existing partners that want to work in this region based on the quality work, because it's also very important, the quality work that you deliver attract also additional partners that want to achieve in this region. So it's a very complex, but we have to work on it. We, there is no one way solution or one way to be taken. We have to combine all the different sources and all the possibility to continue working as long as possible. Thank you so much. Um, Blake, please. Yeah, thank you. This is a it's a very interesting question. Um, yeah, how do you ensure funding and 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 funding for some of these programs um, and initiatives around the world, you know, not just in West Africa. I mean, but I I think there is some there's there's real reason for optimism here and that I think the international funding community uh, understands the problem, understands the challenges, the both in, in terms of capacity and technology. Um, and there's a real thirst for different types of uh, funding, different types of um, strategies uh, in combating IOU and keeping some of these initiatives running. I mean, it is, we're seeing, I think, just, just anecdotally over the last couple of two or three years, you're seeing an explosion of um, international media uh, covering IOU concerns. It's not a niche environmental uh, a story. It's something that uh, is spilling over into when you see the Economist uh, routinely cover IOU uh, concerns. That raises the profile globally. It has a lot more understanding. And what we're you know we're seeing we're obviously funded by a lot of different types of funders in the work that we do. And we find that these you know whether it's foundations themselves, whether it's um, development banks or bilateral aid organizations, they understand the challenges they, uh, and they're interested in improving the capacity um, at, at different levels and exploring some of the, uh, you know, what are the solutions, what is scalable, um, and what are some of the technologies either available now or that are in, in development that could be, uh, that could be helpful. And um, sometimes the, the fixes are very small, um, but the small fixes um, can be extremely, they can, you know, if aggregated can have tremendous results. And so, um, so you know, a lot of the initiatives, a lot of the organizations on there, I know they're funded by some of them th themselves are funded by organizations. Some of them are funded by a organizations as well. So I think it's, it's, it's a very, uh, creative and aware funded community, um, and interested in, you know, ensuring that, that current technologies, whether it's, uh, vessel tracking or using satellites or, um, uh, AI and machine learning in so many ways, it's tremendous to see what is being done already. And, and you see this being applied all over the place. Um, the Global Fishing Watch, TMT, I feel that every year there's like a big story that they break about um, previously unknown, uh, you know, armada of fishing vessels uh, um, off of Iran, for example, and a new squid fishery, I think was like last year. And they're the ones who broke uh, um the, the story of the uh, the fishing vessels outside the Galapagos. There was also the um, kind of the uh, illegal fishing in North Korean waters. That was uh, maybe a year or two ago. Um, and so you're seeing just a greater, you know, greater capacity, greater uh, transparency um, of what 
are these activities? What are what's the full scope of the acti activities, both within EECs and also on the high seas that these uh, these vessels are um, engaging in? OK, thank you so much for your um, responses. It is much appreciated. So I guess in a nutshell, even though um, funding sometimes might not be an issue, what I am taking out of it is that there's an, a need for synergy because obviously there's no synergy. You risk replication, you risk implementing projects that are not necessarily useful for the country you're trying to support if you're trying to support them. And also in terms of the funding, I guess, once this signage is, is achieved, then um, I, I actually like the, the, the fact that in thinking about how countries or agencies like yourself, SCWC, for example, is trying to think about funding, you're also thinking outside the bus. What can we do to support ourselves beyond that kind of support or external support? Because it doesn't come all the time or it doesn't come sometimes when you time. need it, you have to wait until it's actually time. So thank you so much for 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 those points. Um, for our listeners, I, I I hope you can now then ask some questions if you have any. And whilst you're thinking of your question, you can just type it on the Q and A box. Whilst you're thinking, um, I'd like to invite Lucas <laughs> in case to um, ask your question whilst uh, our listeners are are thinking of what question to type in. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. If uh, thank you both, uh, Dr. Seraphine and Blake, uh, for this excellent conversation. It's been really, really uh, insightful to hear uh, you all, and also if his comments. Uh, so my question is actually about we're discussing. You know, as, as we discussed, earlier, you can see the many gaps and the many difficulties of addressing IUU, uh, both in kind of in the MES, uh, MSC specifically, but also in the governance side. And and and, uh, and enforcement, right? Uh, but one one thing that we, we haven't discussed yet is that I think uh, Blake mentioned it very briefly is the linkage between making sure that uh, legal fishing is also sustainable fishing, right? Uh, and I think that's that's kind of like it's linked to to governance, of course, we're having good regulation uh, with monitoring, but also to making sure that uh, we that there is like a way for making that licenses, for instance, or uh, that the that the that the monitoring is 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 uh, associating uh, the, the 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 fishing that is allowed with, for instance, the establishing accurate uh, MSI, right, and maximum sustainable yields. Uh, and so I would I would like to a bit a bit to ask you uh, uh, what are the main challenges on this side of actually having good uh, estimate of fish stocks uh, and tying that to the uh, MSC strategies, uh, of especially in, in the EEZs uh, of different countries in the global south? It's a, it's a very, very key question. Eh? But if I look at the global trends, of the stock in the region and all the report that CCAF has been brought in on the species. Uh, the, we all agree that the key species that we, the population and the fisheries industry is relying on is declining. So I don't think that we can use how you or I expect how you to be a positive impact, impact here because the, the trend is already worse. So, so I'm not really thinking that here in the context of the West Africa, the what I know about the resources, this could be an opportunity. I don't think so. Am I bit of chime in? That's yeah. It's, it, these are tremendous, um, tremendous issues. Um, there are numerous gaps and difficulties, um, uh, but it, ensuring sustainability. You know, it, it's. That seems like something that's under it underpins um, the you know combating IU fishing, um, but uh, oftentimes you can have completely uh, legal, unsustainable uh, fishing. You know, and so that's like another that just goes to um, countries uh, understanding what their fish stocks are, what the fish you know what are the accurate numbers of of of, of the catch, um, uh, and. It does not seem like a lot of, you know, a lot of coastal developing states have accurate uh, understanding, maybe a better sense now, but historically 
there have been, it seems from what we see in our in our research, um, insufficient data over even last like, you know, recent yeah. couple of years on stocks, um, what are precisely what are what are coming in. Um, and uh, you're seeing a lot of practices that uh, hurt uh, the stock even beyond just a straight catch, you know, looking at um, how you're getting a lot of rapacious uh, um, fish meal operations all along, uh, for example, West Africa, you're seeing all these fish meal um, operations come up, which are, you know, uh, making fish meal and fish oil, and they're scooping up all the bycatch, they're scooping up, they're indiscriminate in what's being caught, they're not, not staying to a particular species, they're kind of catching everything and turning things into fish meal and fish oil. Um, uh, you know, we've, we've had a lot of interesting conversations about psychofishing in Ghana, and what a, a pernicious... Uh, challenge and the challenge of solving that, and yet we've heard from 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 locals that in some ways it's uh, a necessary evil uh, that you know if they didn't have these big blocks of bycatch coming in, in so many ways, like at least it's not being fully wasted or fully ground up and uh, used elsewhere for aquaculture or um, some other purposes. So it's it's it makes for very challenging. Um, you know, uh, what are the policy fixes for that um, at the national level, the region, sub-regional and regional levels and internationally? Um, and again, it comes down to, you know, is there a political will for these countries to understand what their stocks are? Is there a political will to make the changes necessary to rein in um, the licensing to understand that better, uh, provide for sufficient enforcement? And you're seeing the trends are increasing um, and you're seeing a lot of countries, uh, particularly in West Africa, it seems like there's a lot of initiative and a lot of uh, they understand the challenges, they understand the implementation challenges, the imp implementation gap. Uh, and so um, it's 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 so hard to find uh, optimism when, uh, you know, demand for the fish keeps going up. Uh, there's still overcapacity, there's still unsustainable catching. Um, and yet uh, it's still, you know, coastal communities still seem like they're uh, competing very, you know, going after very few fish, um, which are being sucked up by trawlers sometimes. So it's like a, but they're, uh, the, you know, the, the trend should be hopefully with, with galvanized international support, aid agencies, development banks, sub-regional efforts, you know, there should be reason um, uh, to take these challenges on together. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much for your responses to that question. And I mean, we don't have any question as yet. And I just want to abuse my privilege as a moderator to just chip in and say something about your question, um, Lucas. Of course, the issue of legal fishing is also a problem because unfortunately it allows for over exploited species to be exploited. And as Daddy highlighted, a lot of fish stock already over exploited, even without talking about IE fishing and the impact it's having. And this is why the recent conversations around subsidy is very important because research has shown, and this is why the WTO have been having this conversation um, and academics and CSOs have been campaigning, if I can put it that way, for countries to revisit. And this is actually a typical example of how international governance can help, international cooperation can help ensure fishery sustainability because if they address or if they're able to address the issue of harmful subsidies or should i say the subsidies that allow vessels to target over exploited species we will go a long way in, in not only improving fish stock we're not even talking about are you fishing as yet but we'll improve fish stock we will improve to a large extent the livelihood of coastal communities that rely on some of these species that have been targeted by vessels legally so I feel that this is actually something that needs to happen. And this is one clear example. And it's coincidental and also hopeful that this is something that was just discussed um, last week. And some people are celebrating it as positive. But of course, we would see when it comes to, you know, how it is ratified and how countries actually decides or chooses to implement the provisions or the agreement that they've made. Also something that is very important that for me also highlights the importance of international cooperation and collaboration, especially in areas or for countries that do not have the well without, is 
stock assessment, you know, there's a need for it, but so many vessels in the global north, uh, sorry, global south, many of which are in, in Western Central Africa or throughout the African continent do not have that, you know, that capacity to engage in fish stock assessment. You cannot know what you've lost unless you know what you have. And so I think actually this is something that is very important. And I know from the work that FCWC is doing and some of the things I've read, they're trying to support and see how, you know, countries can work together. But then you need funding. And this is why I had to ask the question about funding. And I hope that it is clear, at least um, from the international collaboration or support perspective, that they see clearly and work with agencies on the ground to see what the needs are and what needs to happen to ensure continuity of some of the progress we've listened to today and, and also see better ways of supporting um, coastal communities because the reality is that fisheries governance need to improve because fish stock is depleting. So thank you so much everyone for listening. You don't have any questions and I think this is actually credit to us because it means that our participants, our um, presenters, our guests were very clear. And yes, I do say they are very clear because I understood everything and learned so much from the interaction. I want to give you the last words. Do you have anything to sort of point of reflection you want to leave us with as we conclude today's uh, webinar? Yes, OK, I will start. Uh, the first, I would like to take the Institute of uh, international affairs by organizing this, uh, this this meeting because once again it gives light to the fishery sector and the fisheries uh, activity that we are doing in, uh, in West Africa particular, in particular and having it aside of this uh, ocean uh, uh, conference is very pertinent and I would like also to use the opportunity knowing that you are working in the Norwegian uh, international affairs to really salute the effort of the Norway in this international community to assist the fishery sector. Uh, we are well located to know all the program that Norway is doing around the world, but in particular in our region, we are, we are, this the support has been very, very key, has been a catalysis for us to really build this regional cooperation. And as I mentioned, the way forward, we want now to build on all these tools, all this experience to set up a dedicated program on ocean governance. And we really look at, look at also to uh, Norway because we know that in Norway, you have some key uh, institution, uh, university that are really very key in this area that could probably partner with agencies, uh, training agencies in our region to set up such kind of program. And this is a, another way of collaboration because the, the international support should not be only uh, financial resources, it could be experiences, could be um, a a practical experience that can be shared and uh, move quickly the things they were uh, forward. So I would like to emphasize on this and uh, there's one key experience that we have demonstrated in our region with this uh, platform is the collaboration with uh, NGO and national, uh, let's say, uh, public agencies. Through Tragma Cracking, Global Fishing Watch, Stop Illegal Fishing, and FCC. And that's all, that, that consortium has helped us to really improve our, our capacity and also move ahead. And this is very important. I remember when we started this partnership, people was a bit hesitating, hesitating that, okay, uh, normally the NGOs doesn't really focus on what the government want. They want to just have publicity or this thing. That's not the case. We have been able to really build a framework with concrete results, and that is helping of today to, to as as. as experiences of this region that we are sharing. So this is also something positive that is good to be highlighted in this kind of platform. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, and thank you uh, uh, to the Norwegian Institute. Uh, uh, having the conversation at the outset before UNOC, I think helps set the stage and sets the framework, uh, particularly for IAU concerns um, over the next week. There's obviously a lot that will be discussed and um, a huge set of you know, commitments and advancements, hopefully, 
um, next week uh, across a lot of other blue economy and ocean related uh, uh, concerns. But you know, IU fishing is, uh, you know, is is it's so interdisciplinary, so global, um, and yet so personal, and how it affects uh, uh, communities around the world. Um, that it's uh, you know it, it it's good to have a conversation and set the stage uh, in advance, and you know Norway itself is a tremendous supporter and convener um, in support of uh, international environmental and resource protection, um, not just in fisheries but in so many other areas, forestries, uh, deforestation, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, it's very grateful to see uh, Norway's uh, 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 continued engagement, support, and uh, you know um, it, it, and, and pushing towards uh, not just bilateral but um, international and uh, you know cross sectoral uh, cooperation, whether it's public private partnerships or across different sectors. So just very grateful um, for that and to be part of the conversation. Thank you. Adminden, thank you, three of you, uh, for this great conversation. I feel very privileged being uh, uh, attending this event, and I hope our, our audience have also uh, learned as much as I have. Uh, and so we just let me thank you, uh, the audience, and you all, and, and conclude this event with a with a mind for following the developments next week of the United Nations uh, Ocean Conference. Thank you very much.